So I have been fortunate to have uh, Thibault as a collaborator and a friend for many years. So today I'm, I would like to talk about two topics which I know are close to his heart, which are black holes and cosmic strings. Uh, so I'm going to argue that uh, loops of cosmic string can be captured into, a bla into black holes and then they can interact with black holes in a very interesting way. Uh, this is uh, based on my work with Henrik Singh, Yuri Levin, and Andrei Gruzinov. Uh, okay, I don't know. Maybe I, I can do it like that. So first, let me uh, briefly review some relevant properties of cosmic strings. Uh, Strings uh, could be formed at symmetry-breaking phase transitions in the early universe. Uh, and uh, they are predicted in a wide class of elementary particle models. The strings are topolog linear topological defects. Uh, they don't have ends. They can be either from closed loops or extend to infinity. Uh, the main parameter characterizing the strings is the mass per unit length, which we will denote mu. And uh, it's determined mostly by the symmetry breaking energy scale. Uh, a convenient dimensionless combination is g mu, where g is Newton's constant. And if uh, the symmetry breaking scale varies between electroweak and grand unification, this parameter g mu varies in this huge range from 10 to the minus 34 to 10 to the minus 6. The strings have large tension, which is equal to the mass per unit length, which is just a consequence of relativistic invariance. And uh, because of this large tension, if you have a closed loop of string, it oscillates relativistically. Uh, another important property of string is that when uh, okay, th th does this, this doesn't seem to work. Uh, so when two strings cross, they reconnect as shown here. So what do I pr press? The red. That one? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so when they cross, they reconnect at the, cr at the crossing point, and this provides a mechanism for the formation of closed loops. Uh, the dynamics of strings is determined by the Nambu-Gotter action, which is simply proportional to the uh, world sheet area of this described by the string in space-time. Uh, the solution of uh, corresponding equations of motion is very simple. Uh, it's given by this, where a and b are two arbitrary vector functions, arbitrary except that they satisfy these constraints. Sigma is a parameter along the string, uh, and it varies between 0 and L, where L is what is called the invariant length. It is just the mass of the loop divided by mu. Uh, this solution describes a loop which oscillates periodically with a period L over 2. Now, a s if a loop of string runs into a black hole by some part of it, it will be captured, like shown here. And we will be interested in the situation where the black hole is very small compared to the loop. Uh, so the size of the black hole is about gm, where m is, is its mass. So the loops is very large, but at the same time, the black hole is much more massive than the loop. In this situation, you can think of this uh, location where the black hole is as a point where the, blue, uh, the loop is spinned, right? So then you have just have to solve the Nambu-Gotter equations of motion with boundary conditions that there is one loop, one point on the loop which remains fixed. And then the solution depends on one rather than two arbitrary functions, and it's given by this. And the loop oscillation period is changed. Now it is 2L rather than L over 2. But uh, so far, there is not much different 
from the free loop. Uh, now, such uh, an oscillating loop may self-intersect, and then it will break into two loops, and one part of one of them will fly away. But we experimented with thousands of kind of randomly formed loops, and we discovered that in all of the cases that we looked at, uh, after few reconnections, you're left with a non-intersecting loop, which is pinned to the black hole and keeps oscillating periodically. Okay, so um, now uh, the fact that we now have just one vector function describing the, uh, the dynamics of the loop allows us to think about it in the following way. We take this vector function and plot it. Uh, its length is 2L, where L is the, the invariant length. And this is just a fixed curved curve in three-dimensional space. Uh, so its length is related to the length of the loop. It's uh, twice the length of the loop. But uh, the shape of this curve has little to do with the shape of the physical loop. Right? But uh, this is a very useful object, no nevertheless, as we will see. So uh, this picture that I described, where one point of the loop remains fixed, is uh, exact only in the limit when the size of the black hole ratio of r over l, r is the radius of the black hole, when this ratio goes to zero. When this ratio is finite, there is still some energy and angular momentum exchange between the loop and the black hole. And as a result, this auxiliary curve, as we call it, is changing. But it's changing very slowly because the interaction is rather weak. It's suppressed by a power of r over l. So I will uh, kind of describe exactly how this works. Um, an important solution uh, of uh, stationary solution for a string in the uh, gravitational field of a rotating black hole was found by Frolov and collaborators. And this solution is very helpful for understanding what I'm going to tell you about. Um, so uh, the solution is the following. So this is a rotating black hole. Uh, and its uh, spin is perpendicular to the screen. Uh, the string is this red line. It extends to infinity along a straight line. And as it comes towards the black hole, it starts winding around the horizon. Right? And this is a stationary solution. And then, uh, uh, obviously, this string will exert a torque on a black hole. Um, and this arm of the torque, L, is determined by the mass of the black hole, which is this R, which is GM, and also on the angular velocity, omega. OK, so the torque is simply mu, the tension of the string, times L, and it's given by that. So this is if the string is in the equatorial plane of the um, rotating black hole. Um, now, if the string is directed in some arbitrary direction specified by the unit vector n, then the torque is given by this. Okay, this is just a simple geometry. And then we add this extra term, n cross n dot, which is just uh, allowing the, uh, because our strings are not stationary, we have a string that sticks out of a black hole at two points. And then also these directions are gradually changing. Um, so omega is the angular velocity of this vector determining the direction of the string uh, around the black hole. And this term is added there so that the torque vanishes when the string is co-rotating with, with the black hole, right? Because when it rotates with the black hole, there is no torque. Um, so this, uh, these vectors, n1 and n2, uh, vary on this 
time scale of the loop oscillation, which is of order L, the length of the loop. And this is much greater than the characteristic time scale associated with the black hole. So in this sense, the, these directions are, this situation is quasi-stationary. So from which we conclude that we can use this expression, which was obtained for a stationary solution, but we still assume that it applies locally at any moment of time. We can use this formula. OK, so now uh, we can uh, also calculate the rate of energy change of black hole. Yeah, I, I should say that since the string exerts a torque on a black hole, the black hole exerts the same torque on the string. Um, and once you know the torque uh, and angular velocity, you can write the rate of energy change. This is the work done by the black hole on the string. Um, and this is non-zero even if the velocity, rotational velocity of the black hole is zero. In that case, only that term contributes and the rate, so rate of energy change is given by this formula. And you can, well, omega is of order 1 over L, so this is a small energy change in the sense that R over L squared appears. Um, and you can, from this, easily find that the loop loses all its energy in this way on this time scale, L cube over R squared. And this is obviously much greater than L, which is the one period of oscillation. So it takes many oscillations until the loop loses its energy to this effect, which we call horizon friction. So it basically, the energy is lost because these um, vectors move around along the horizon. OK, in, in general, uh, this is a general situation that the loop orbit uh, evolves slowly compared to the loop oscillation period. And uh, this can be described mathematically as a continuous deformation of this auxiliary curve. So A, a of sigma is that auxiliary curve that I mentioned that describes the solution of uh, a pinned loop. And because of this effect of exchange of energy and angular momentum with the black hole, this auxiliary curve will be gradually deformed. And this is what mathematicians call uh, a geometric flow. Uh, in our case, I will not have time to give you the derivation, but in our case, this flow is described by this equation. V of sigma is the velocity of the point on this auxiliary curve at location sigma. Sigma labels locations along the curve. OK, and it is given in terms of this first and second derivatives of A of sigma. OK, very simple equation. Now, a special case uh, of omega equal to 0 attracted a lot of attention from mathematicians. Uh, so then uh, V is proportional to A, a double prime. This is basically, th this is the curvature of this curve. And this is, uh, this even has a special name, curve shortening flow. So you can uh, see that the directions of the flow are indicated here. So when it is, uh, it will be moving out at this point, but inwards elsewhere. And so the result will be that the curve will become more and more round, and also it will be shrinking. Once it is round, it's obvious that it's going to be shrinking. And mathematicians proved rigorously that the asymptotic state of this curve is that a small shrinking circle. Uh, OK, and uh, the length of the curve is, pro is twice the length of the physical loop. So this means that the loop loses its energy and eventually it is swallowed by the black hole. Uh, but as I said, the physical uh, loop is different from this. It's not circular at all. So you can uh, find that uh, a circular um, auxiliary curve corresponds 
to a rotating double line. So the, this is a black hole, the string comes out radially and then comes back along the same line. And it ro this double line rotates around the black hole um, in such a way that its tip rotates at the speed of light. Um, so this configuration actually is a strong emitter of gravitational waves. If you calculate, uh, using perturbation theory, if you calculate the rate of gravitational radiation, you find that it is logarithmically divergent. Uh, but uh, of course, the actual rate will be finite. Um, for one reason, for one uh, thing is because the string is not infinitely thin. And also, this asymptotic configuration of double line is never physically reached. So it will be close to double line. OK, more interesting things occur if uh, we allow uh, omega rotation velocity of black hole to be non-zero. So then this first term becomes important. And you see each uh, derivative with respect to sigma gives you a factor of 1 over L. So the first term is dominant if omega L is much greater than 1. That is, if the string is sufficiently long. Then the first term dominates. And to see what effect it has, uh, let us consider, again, a circular auxiliary curve. Right? So suppose this curve is, is circular, and suppose the omega angular velocity is points perpendicular to the screen. In that case, the velocity of deformation can be directed radially outward everywhere. So the loop will be growing instead of shrinking. Right? And it will continue growing. If, if, uh, once you are in this configuration, the loop will keep growing, uh, extracting energy from the black hole. So where this energy comes from? It comes from the rotational energy of the black hole. So uh, by solving the, uh, this equation, you can find that the length of the loop grows like square root of t. Um, and uh, you may be wondering how important this effect would be if I, for example, have a string attached to a super heavy black hole in our galactic center. And you find that it will be spun down completely uh, during its, its lifetime if g mu is sufficiently large, if it is greater than 10 to the minus 15. But 10 to the minus 15 is pretty small value. It is well below the current upper bounds on this g mu. So it's, uh, this effect can be quite significant in our actual universe. Uh, another very interesting effect is uh, very similar to superradiance, which was first pointed out by Jakob Zildovich. Um, uh, Zildovich pointed out that uh, if you have a black hole, uh, a rotating black hole, and you have a circularly polarized electromagnetic wave, this wave can be reflected from the black hole with amplification. Uh, here, a very similar effect. If you have uh, a helical wave traveling along the string, around the string and hitting the black hole, it also ref reflects with greater amplitude. But the interesting thing here is that now this wave travels all the way around the loop and hits the black hole on the other side. And it's amplified again. So as a result, you will, uh, even if you start with a tiny amplitude helical wave, the amplitude will grow exponentially. And the corresponding time scale is given by this. Um, so for maximally rotating black hole, this omega r is of order 1. And the time scale is comparable to the loop oscillation period, which is much faster than the other time scales associated with this problem. So one can imagine a scenario where uh, this uh, superradiance uh, kind effect 
extracts rotational energy from the black hole, then this wave becomes nonlinear. Once it becomes nonlinear, it's easily imagined that self intersections will result in loop formation. And uh, so the loops will be produced, will fly away. And uh, so this uh, loop attached to the black hole can become a loop factory, kind of, by tr turning the rotational energy of the black hole into a number of closed loops. OK, so these are the physical effects that can occur. And now I would like to uh, address the question how likely it is for a loop of string to actually be attached to a black hole. So just a quick review of string evolution. If strings were formed in uh, the early universe, uh, numerous simul uh, numerical simulations have shown that they evolve in a scale invariant way. So each horizon volume in the universe looks something like this, uh, with uh, several long strings stretching across the horizon, and a large number of closed loops, which are barely visible here, they are shown in red. And these loops are, have a, a wide distribution of sizes. Um, so the loops oscillate and decay by emitting gravitational waves. Uh, as a side comment, I'll mention that these waves add up to a stochastic gravitational wave background. And uh, I enjoyed many discussions and writing papers with Tibor on the properties of this background. In particular, we found that this gravitational wave background is highly non-Gaussian and includes large bursts of gravitational radiation. But uh, now we will not be worried about uh, this background. Um, the de average density of loops is proportional to g mu to the minus 3 halves. So the smaller g mu is, the larger is the density. And this is easy to understand because if g mu is small, the gravitational radiation is small, and so the loop decays uh, slower by gravitational radiation. Therefore, the number of loops is larger. And therefore, you could expect that the capture probability is higher for small values of g mu. And this is indeed what one finds. Uh, so we found that the probability of capture yeah, the, the most probable, mm, it's most probable for, for a loop to be captured by the supermassive black hole, by a supermassive black hole, uh, because simply because it has much bigger radius than, uh, than smaller black holes. And um, the probability that uh, a supermassive black hole, say, at uh, the center of our galaxy, uh, has captured a loop is of order 1 if g mu is satisfies this condition. If g mu is less than 10 to the minus 18, um, and, and this, I don't give the details of this calculation because you have to include the fact that the loops concentrated galactic halos and then their density increases towards the center. So when you include all, the, all that, you find this condition. Um, a very different scenario is obtained if the black holes are primordial. Um, primordial black holes are formed in the early universe by collapse of large density fluctuations. And the fluctuations in the early universe can collapse only if they have a horizon size. So, uh, so you have these, this horizon volume, and you have a fluctuation collapse into a black hole, which has size comparable to the horizon. And you see it is inevitable that this uh, black hole will capture a few strings. right? And then these strings will run from one black hole to another. 
so the result is that you have a black hole string network, uh, which is an interesting object to study, uh, but it's hard to tell much about how it will evolve without a numerical simulation. So now these simulations are underway. So in conclusion, I argued that string loops can be captured by black holes. And moreover, this is even likely if, of course, assuming that strings exist. We know that black holes exist. And uh, this is likely for sufficiently small values of g mu. Once it happens, this triggers a variety of physical effects, such as black hole spin down, the superradiant amplification of waves, gravitational wave emission. Um, and I should uh, finally say that this, this is work in progress because First of all, for all these effects, we have not really uh, included the effect of string reconnections, and that needs numerical simulations to study. Uh, also, the evolution of black hole string network networks needs to be studied, um, and there are other things as well. Uh, this is all I had to say. Uh, pleasure to be here. Happy birthday, Tibor. equation of evolution of the formal shape of the string, we did not include gravitational radiation back reaction because it's always negligible compared to the effects you were discussing. It's, it's usually negligible, yeah, but, but uh, you're right. Th that equation does not include gravitational back reaction. Maybe you can ex uh, generalize it. There is an, an interaction between string. You may see a string as a topological defect in space time. <coughs> the, the interaction is a, just like the Casimir effect due to quantum fluctuation. If you compute energy density without string and with the topological defect, they are different, then you can compute the interaction between the string. I don't uh, remember. Sorry, it is not, it is not really. Uh, like Casimir effect. Uh, Casimir effect is due to quantum fluctuations. Yes, it's for, for and quantum this one, this one no. has, is not quantum fluctuation. No. This is just a classical solution. What I say is that there is an interaction due to quantum fluctuation between string. <coughs> Did you take this into account in your simulation? Like, because I think it, it's important in this. Uh, you mean uh, interaction between string? Suppose you have two strings. Oh, two strings. The, the sure. The force between the two due to the yeah, the, there is of course uh, an interaction due to quantum effects, but but this would be negligible for the parameters that I am discussing here. Okay, there it depends on the. Sorry, because I remember it could be very important if the string is if the topological defect is enough uh, strong, enough important. Yes, but but we already have significant bounds coming actually from study of. Uh, gravitational radiation from strings, we have significant bounds on what this GMU is, and it is pretty small. So there's one uh, question also on the chat. Maybe you can go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, thank you very much. I don't if you can hear me. Yes. I wanted to understand what limits on the string tension or generally string parameter space will you be able to set uh, based on the various physical effects on uh, supermassive black holes that you envisage. Uh, would, would that in particular, would that exclude new parts of the string uh, parameter space? Thank you. Uh, well, at present, the strongest uh, bound on uh, this G mu of strings comes from observations of millisecond pulsars. Um, it's uh, conceivable that even stronger bounds come from interactions of strings with black holes. But in order to really put reliable bounds, we have to finish these numerical simulations so that, because now some effects are not accounted for, like uh, crossing of the strings 
and so forth. So um, at present, we cannot improve on the uh, millisecond bound. OK. Here. Ah, here. <laughs> <laughs> when the string loop is captured by the supermassive black hole, there will be a burst of gravitational waves. Is there a mean to distinguish the signal from uh, the signal emitted by some emery or uh, an ordinary black hole captured by the black hole? Uh, well, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that the capture event will be uh, uh, very spectacular. But when, you, when the string evolves and when it becomes close to a rotating double line, it tip, uh, the tip of this double line acts like a cusp on, on a loop. So basically, the tip is a strong emitter. If we, uh, but of course, you have to be lucky because if the tip rotates like in this plane, you have to be lucky to be kind of looking in the right direction. But there are many black holes uh, in the universe. So in principle, we can observe these bursts of radiation from these rotating uh, double lines. Uh, but I, I don't think that the capture moment will be very important in terms of gravitational radiation. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Okay, thank you.